Hi everybody, Andy here. Just before we start this week's episode, wanted to introduce you to our special guest. This week's guest is the brilliant Stevie Martin. If you haven't heard of Stevie, you are in for a treat. She is a fantastic comedian. Everything she makes is good. She makes wonderful sketches, she's in shows, she's on stuff. And if you want to hear more of her after this episode, which you will, check out her podcast, which is called Nobody Panic. It's a great show. It contains advice about absolutely everything in the world. Uh, how to do your taxes, how to uh, brush your hair. Some even funnier things than that, can you believe it? Uh, and uh, it's a great show. I think I did an episode recently which is coming up for release, uh, but just start listening to that now. Once again, it's called Nobody Panic. Hope you enjoy this show. On with the podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber, I'm sitting here with Andrew Hunter-Murray, Anna Tashinsky, and Stevie Martin, and once again we have gathered round the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days, and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Stevie. My fact is that Australia is wider than the moon, <laughs> except Technically, it's not. What? Oh, wow. No. Huh? You can't row back on the back. I did some verification. I think you're absolutely I've, right. I'm going to back myself more, says my mum. Um, <laughs> so it is, if I was looking at it, yeah. it would be. But if I was, like, taking into account surface area, perhaps, and the fact that it's a sphere... That's, oh, right. that's not Come what on. you said. Yeah, man. You okay. said wider. Wider. Yeah, if yeah. we moved Australia, so yeah. it's in the place of the moon, yeah. Yeah. it would be. It, it would, would look cover like it the, from yeah. left to right and then some. Yeah. yeah, like an eclipse. Like it could. You could move the moon and it would block the sun. What possibly. An would it? Is it tall what, enough? Australia. Yeah. It may not be yeah. tall enough. I don't know. Is Australia quite flat? Is it a flat boy from the top to the bottom? It's why I think that you would get bits of moon poking out. I don't think there's any Australia arrangement that totally covers the moon, but yeah. it's definitely wider left to right. There's no doubt. Yeah. But you might be able to cut bits off or move Tasmania, for instance, to oh. one of the poking to out bits. It. They'd Absolutely. love that. They'd love that. Politically controversial yeah. plan already. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> feels like they've probably had to put up with a lot. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Um, so the moon is about three and a half thousand kilometers across and Australia is about, when we look at it in the sky, and Australia is about 4,000 yeah, kilometers? It's, it's, like that. it's yes. about 4,000, yeah. Did you yes. know that the smallest moon of Jupiter, which is so small, it's called just called, called Jupiter LII, oh. it doesn't have a name, is the same size as Vatican City? Is it? Yeah. It's almost not worth it. It's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth do it we all. know it's a moon? What's the, does anyone know what the smallest amount has to be for it to be a moon? Oh, there are all sorts of Is it of the Vatican City? Is that it? That's it. Yeah. 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 If it can have a Pope, it's a moon. It's a moon. That's it. <laughs> It's hugely it's like contentious. <laughs> that, that question's hugely contentious in, right. the, in that world. Okay, yeah. we'll get we emails, do... just dozens, hundreds of emails now that you've asked. Wait, yeah. doesn't the moon have a bishop? I'm sure we've vaguely said this in the past, that what? there is a guy whose role is Bishop of the Moon. Oh, yes, yeah, when Wasn't they there? tried to claim it as theirs, yeah. <laughs> and it got given its own bishop. I mean, I think self-proclaimed. Is that like where, is it when I was 14, my mum uh, bought me a little plot of land on the moon? And you get a little deed. So I've got a deed. Oh, no. You did that. So if there's any mineral rights in, like, maybe a centimetre square yeah. somewhere you'll on like, the you'll moon. Get, you'll get none of it. I will right. get yeah. none of it because it's not legally binding. <laughs> because I'm sure she bought it in, like, a paper chase. Um, but if the, so the, the bishop thing, I think, checks out. Imagine if there was a bishop in my bit. That's incredible. <laughs> well, that's why the Pope Mobile has that dome over the top, the bubble. Because people it's, own it. It's so that he can, if he needs to, he can operate in a lunar environment. <laughs> yes. I also own a possession. small square of the Pope as well that's like <laughs> my 15th birthday wouldn't it be crazy for the UN or whoever it is to say right we are going to divide up the moon but we've decided that paper chase are the people who are going to administer <laughs> yes. this system you do need people to do admin you do you do they might have put in the best bid you're absolutely right. I don't think that's too far a crazy <laughs> idea. They've got the paper to make the certificates. I think it's a really... <laughs> it was high GSM. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, here's an interesting thing. So the space between the moon and the Earth, right? Yeah. So that is roughly, because it, it changes all the time, but at, like it's furthest, it's big enough that you could take all of our planets in the solar system and you could put them next to each other in one big row and they would all fit between the space 
between the Earth and the Moon. No, no. yeah, that is yeah. good. Yeah, isn't How? that extraordinary? Even Jupiter. But Jupiter's so big. No, <laughs> excluding <laughs> Jupiter. Sorry, I forgot to mention, <laughs> not, not Jupiter. <laughs> 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 I always think we don't make a massive enough deal about the coincidence of the moon and the sun and the fact that we can have a full eclipse, right? Because the only reason we can have a full solar eclipse is the fact that the moon and the sun look exactly the same size Mm. to us on Earth. And that's just a total coincidence. It's just proportionally the size of the moon and the distance of the moon from us makes it the same size to us. And then in a million years, when the because the moon's moving away like a few centimetres a year, yeah. we yeah. won't have right. full eclipses anymore because it'll be too far away to cover the entirety of the sun. Yeah. yeah. And the chances were just infinitesimally tiny, and I think that is evidence for a higher power, if mm. ever there was it, <laughs> the fact that they're basically the same size to us. I like the idea that in the future, when, it's, when the moon is smaller and it goes across, it'll make the sun look like a bagel. <laughs> Oh, no, yeah. yeah. A really yeah. stingy bagel, though. Imagine getting a bagel that thin with a huge hole. Yeah, I like that, though. Um, can I tell you about um, Aust- the first Australian person to go to space? Ooh, yeah. Paul Desmond Scully Power. Cool. cool. He's the That's first good. ever um, astronaut, I'm calling him. Nice. I did try and find online if anyone's used that. I don't think anyone says astronaut. Maybe oh, because trade market now. It's happened to one guy. <laughs> let's, 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 also, it could be like Austrian as well, so it's kind of confusing. Oh yeah, oh, yeah that'll be yeah. that'll lead to heaps of confusion. Yeah, when, you so know, yeah. I was confused. Dozens and dozens of yeah. Um, but he's he was also the first astronaut with a beard. Wow. Yeah. In the gravity, his beard would be floating it all would. over the place like yeah. he was a wizard. Exactly. Wait, how, <laughs> how, how, was it like my beard, or are we talking Gandalf? It's in between. It's, he didn't have a Gandalf beard, very sadly. I think even NASA, NASA did try and make him shave, and he said, no, it's fine. And so he... Um, they tried to make a trade. They said it won't form an airtight seal, and presumably you'll asphyxiate. And he said, <laughs> oh, "I think it'll be all right. Oh, it's worth the risk. <laughs> She'll be right." <laughs> he's such. He is so Aussie. It's brilliant. Like he said, uh, going to space was just one of those things that happened. Because he started off as a, an oceanographer, and then he, because he liked surfing and was studying maths, and then he got into the Aussie Navy, and then he exchanged over to the U.S. Navy, and they said, "Do you want? We need to, someone to do a naval study, an ocean study rather, from space. So mm-hmm. do you want to?" You know, get on board, and he did. He's he's founded a drone company called the Ripper Group. Um, <laughs> he's created shark finding AI. Oh my god! He's just so, like <laughs> it's in his contract, conforming to stereotype. <laughs> like, really, like, <laughs> we'll only let you up there if I know. As the shuttle was about to take off, you know, you're sitting like I guess you're facing the sky, so you're sort of lying on your back within a chair, right? <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> he fell asleep. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I thought you were saying he like barbecue something. Exactly. Yeah. He, he stood in a surf position as it went up. That's amazing. And his beard, his beard will, will have yeah. been sort of parted as they, as they went. Oh. All you could see is the rocket left the atmosphere. Two strands of beard. Anyway, wow. what a guy. What a guy. What's, yeah. he, na- what's he called? He's called Paul Desmond Scully Power. A great name yeah, yeah really Paul strong. Power Paul Power <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant yeah. Um, there's just speaking of the moon and Australia yeah uh, I found a really cool thing online and it's an interactive page and it's created it's this website that's created by the people who wrote a book called Cosmos the infographic book of space which I think has loads of really cool infographics about space in it as you'd expect <laughs> <laughs> whoa it's a shame they couldn't nail that onto the, uh, the cover somehow <laughs> they needed me writing their subtitle um, anyway. your Amazon reviews of books are so shit aren't they? they're so bad <laughs> anyway, they've also got a website and um, they have this whole interactive section. And one of the interactive sections, which I strongly recommend that you Google, is um, you can see how high a human or a kangaroo could jump on various celestial bodies. <laughs> so they'll drop down, you can select human or kangaroo, mm. no other things. Because um, <laughs> they're the two main ones that would go into space. And then, yeah, you can see how high they jump. So on um, the moon, we could jump three meters. Pretty good. Yeah. Kangaroo, 11 meters better mm. it's always better the kangaroo i was gonna say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's relative isn't it yeah yeah um it's really fun quite a lot it really tricks you and i wasted a lot of time because it has things like some of the tiniest moons in the solar system and it'll do see how high you could jump on this and you click jump and then you sit there as it goes up and up and it doesn't really tell you if it's going to go on forever or if it's going to stop at some point so mm. i did sit there for about eight minutes watching it go up and up thinking i wonder if i'm coming back down and sometimes you don't really gosh yeah bleak, well if, isn't it? it's yeah it's a bit sad don't <laughs> don't, don't jump, jump. On, yeah. like asteroids and stuff um 
You know how the moon looks uh, too too big? It looks bigger than it is when we look at it. Too big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you look at the moon in the night sky, you think, oh, what a beautiful moon. Then you take a yeah. photo and there's a dot. Yes. Oh. oh I did yeah. that this morning. Right. Yes. And it's really weird. It's a weird effect. Yeah, why is that, though? Well... We sort of prioritise it more with our with our eyes. Oh, okay. Um, but all, I mean, there are various reasons why. Sometimes the moon looks very big with near the horizon because it's closer to things that we recognise, like you know, houses or trees or whatever. You know, you sort of see it in reference to those, and you think you think it's bigger than it is. Mm. But wait, are you but, saying then it takes you so long to grapple to get your camera that by the time you've taken the photo, it's actually moved up into the sky? No, because even <laughs> when you look at it in the night sky, it looks bigger to to our eyes than it does on a camera. You know, okay. and cameras mm. are telling the truth. Um, but there is a way of negating the effect of the moon, this effect of it looking too big, which is to look at it upside down. Oh. Yeah. How do I turn then the moon I go, upside down? Oh, I do a headstand. You, you, put, go, you, you go to Australia. You, you go to Australia. <laughs> you put your head between your legs okay. as you're standing there, <clears throat> and it looks the right size again. Really? Yeah, oh, this was yeah. studied by two Japanese scientists. They won an Ig Nobel Prize for their paper. <laughs> for telling people to put their head between perceived, the legs and look at the moon. Perceived size and perceived distance of targets viewed from between the legs. I almost oh, wow. almost want to disagree with them, but it's it's a fact. You haven't tried it. But True. next time you're out on a, like, a romantic nighttime stroll yeah. and the person you're with says, look at the lovely moon, you can say to them, no, look at it between your legs nice. and we'll see it. But that it works, only, like sometimes, uh, I think it was the last year, you could see Jupiter really well um, next to the moon. And uh, yeah, I looked at some planes, but then I also did see Jupiter. So if I looked between my legs, it would look like Jupiter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it brings it closer <laughs> to you. Oh, wait, no, to make it smaller. No, it looks smaller. It looks oh, smaller for between God. your legs. So yeah. I wanted the opposite. Okay, fine, right. Yeah. I want to get my legs through my head. It'll yes. just bring it. Yeah. Right, okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, check this out. I don't fully understand the science of this, but I find it amazing because it's true. Uh, and that is that on a rainy day, if the moon is overhead, it's going to rain less. I know. Yeah. Hmm? That frightens me on a very deep level. On a level. rainy day, <laughs> yeah. if the moon is overhead, yeah. it's going to rain less. Wow. So if the moon, rather than, like, sometimes you see the moon, which is, like, closer to horizontal. On the horizon. But, yeah, mm. exactly. And then you get high in the sky, right? The moon's sp yeah, yeah. Yeah, different yeah, spots the sky. Orbit. When yeah. it's there, let's say it's a cloudy day and it's raining, it's going to rain less. But it's all it the gravitational it pull? Is it sucking? Yeah, sucking yeah. the rain sucking towards the rain it. Up. Yeah. So the rain goes up in the air towards the moon. It, 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 <laughs> <laughs> space rain is what happens. <laughs> Upside down space rain. Okay. What? Well, so it just doesn't. It just it stays within the atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. It clouds, right. So oh. the gravitational pull with the moon, it's all to do with the kind of pressure that it's creating around in the air as well. So the the pressure can suck up the moisture that's in there. So it's just kind of it's not it's not weighted so that it falls down. But uh, so it it will still rain. But by less, it less. does. It does make sense. It would be, it would be freaking bizarre if it just didn't rain in a Truman Show way. Yeah, just yeah, over yeah. That spot where the moon was. But it's less by one percent. That's a lot. Oh, yeah, it's a lot. not a contrary. It's not a lot. <laughs> It's, sorry, that's it's a really a lot, relevant a bit of, of rain. I was about to leave my umbrella at home before Dan said it's one percent. Now I think I'll take it anyway. Yeah, but you can drill a hole in your umbrella that's ten one percent the size of it, and then as long as that's in the right position, then it won't matter. You're fine. Mm. Yeah. It's so, a thought. but they and they did the science. <laughs> they studied it for ages, 1998 to 2012. They were looking at reports, and then they looked at meteorological reports that go all the way back to the 1800s, and they found that on the days where the moon was in those positions, one percent less rainy. One percent less rainy. Nice. I just love that fact so much. Yeah. Yeah. Australia's got its first ever moon rover. It's getting its first ever moon rover. Okay, this is quite oh, cool. Yeah, uh, it's going to go. Why? Up. It's out of, <laughs> it's just, Why are they doing that? Uh, it's just being included on a future mission. I think. Well, Australia has a space program. Ask Paul Power, um, and it's going to be included. But I'd just like to see. Can you guess the name? There were eight thousand suggestions. Oh, okay. Of a name, and one winner, uh, and it's gettable. And is it's it, guessable. And it's an Aussie. 100%. Is it Mooney McMoonface? It's not Mooney McMoonface. Oh, okay. it's something, it's, it is something actually Australian. God. And you're going to kick yourselves right up the Big arse old if you don't moon know spider. <laughs> That's good. So it's a rover. It's a car. Right. It's a... Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. A rune rover. You're so close. Oh, really? Oh, this is can agony. Kangaroo rover. <laughs> What'd you say? Kangaroo rover. I'm going to give it to you. Rover is what its oh, name God. is. What? Rover. I was way closer. What did you say? Rune Rover. Rune Rover. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely not, Dan. That was a shocking. Get that called me. Wait, say that... it again. What is it? Rover. Come on. You should put Kanga in front. She said Kangaroo. Kangaroo Rover. It was closer than Rune. Rune <laughs> Rover. I had to sit here not saying anything, just being like, mm hmm. Yeah. Oh. 
Anyway, it's going to be called Ruva. <clears throat> and it will weigh about the same as a Western Grey Kangaroo. Cool. Oh, really? Or four wallabies. <laughs> Is that deliberate? <laughs> that's deliberate, yeah. That's four integral wall- to the design. <laughs> four wallabies, buy wallabies. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everyone. We'd like to let you know that this week we are sponsored by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN, if you don't have it, you're basically, imagine you're walking a dog in public and you haven't got them on a leash. That's what it's like. You're on the internet without a leash. You don't know who's going to be able to get access to your dog. Oh, no, that is really worrying, actually, especially as I don't have a dog. Uh, But ExpressVPN, what it does, it creates a secure encrypted tunnel beneath your device and the internet. So no one can tell where you are. No one can tell what sites you're on. And if you happen to be in Serbia, say, and there's a huge darts match, you can watch the (laughs) darts match without worrying about finding a Serbian channel to watch it on. Netflix doesn't have All Dogs Goes to Heaven. It doesn't have uh, Turner and Hooch. It doesn't have other <laughs> dog-based movies. K9, well, you could... was that one? K9. It doesn't have uh, Lassie. 101 Dalmatians. It's got none of them. What country are we in that doesn't have any of them? But guess what? Serbia might, along with the darts, have all these movies and you can make yourself there. So if you want to get involved in this exceptional encryption, you can go to expressvpn.com slash fish and you'll get an extra three months for free. And just let me say this one quick fact. It would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. So get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free by going to expressvpn.com slash fish. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash fish. Okay, on with the podcast. Dog-based movies not absolutely guaranteed on Netflix Serbia. And before on with the show... I've just got to say we are also sponsored this week by NetSuite. Yes, we are. NetSuite is the sweet as a nuts net (laughs) place to go (laughs) if your business is kind of falling behind because there's just so much admin for stuff for people to do. It's absolutely right. NetSuite is the one place, a hub, as it were, to bring together all of the things that you need in order to make your business run functionally, run smoothly. And there are three numbers they absolutely want you to know. That's 37,000, 25, and 1. 37,000, that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite. It's hugely popular globally. 25, NetSuite is turning 25 this year. That's how long they've been going and been helping businesses to do more with less so that they can close their books in days and not weeks and drive down all the costs. And one, because, hey, baby, your business is one of a kind. (laughs) Hey, baby, are we bringing that back? (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Your business is one of a kind and you can get a customized solution with NetSuite for all of your KPIs. First thing, it tells you what a KPI is, which is a key performance indicator. It helps you to manage risk, get reliable forecasts and improve margins. Everything you'll need to grow will all be in one place. And right now, in an unprecedented offer, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you constantly excellent performance absolutely free. And you can do that by going to netsuite, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash fish. That's right. So go to netsuite.com slash fish to get your own KPI checklist absolutely free. Do it now. Okay. On with the show. On with the podcast. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that's my fact. My fact this week is that as a child, Roald Dahl was used as a guinea pig for a chocolate factory. Cool, that's very on the nose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> makes me wonder about all the other books as well. Like, did he ha- did he have a big peach one day? <laughs> yes. Was he a twit? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, He so he went to the school called Repton, and at Repton there was a local Cadbury's. It was either a factory or it was just a base where they were sending chocolate out for it to be tested around the country. Either way, what they used to do was they used to ask for kids from the school to apply to be guinea pigs in order to test out these chocolates and see whether they were fit for the market and Dahl happened to be there at the time so he would have been like 13 14 years old at the time yeah he spent four years at this place and it had a huge uh, impact on him he did think off the back of it what's going inside these chocolate factories I bet it's a marvelous incredible place and it was the seed for what then became Charlie and the chocolate factory the pod was a lot of injuries 
Ollie was there. <laughs> <laughs> was that? My chocolate had a finger in it this week. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> wow. Um, um, do yeah. we know if any of the kids um, in that classroom, when the teacher said, have we got any volunteers to test out chocolate in a chocolate factory? <laughs> was there a single child who didn't put their hand up? Yeah. Good it's like point. a dream for a child. It's to, a, it's just, oh my it's God. The, yeah, yeah, it's a dream gig. Um, professional chocolate testers yeah. mm-hmm. are a thing. But not again, not many of them. And it's not as good a gig as, as maybe Dal made it sound. You get quite really? sick. Quite you? sick. You also develop an incredibly advanced palate. Oh, so then, so then nothing satisfies You're you. You're ruined. But basically, oh. you get you get chocolate that's a few hours old. You know, it's ultra fresh, and it's and you you know it's delicious. And you're always thinking whenever you eat anything else. You know, you're ruined for Yorkies, basically. You can't, yeah. like, it just tastes like trash to you. Um, but one thing they do is, that, uh, real chocolate experts and tasters, they listen to the chocolate. Okay. They, uh, What's it saying? <laughs> What's going on there? They, they, <laughs> don't eat me! Is, like, is, is, is that like a phrase, like, wine has a nose or whatever? Is no, it, it like... It literally is. They listen to it. They listen to the, the snap sound it makes when you break a piece of the chocolate. They'll give it a listen to make sure. <gasps> is, is there a thing, like, with cheese, where once I went to a party and someone was like, oh, we fridged the brie for too long! And they were, like, panicking. Could you, like, fridge chocolate or not fridge? You know, because if you put it in the fridge and then you snap it, it goes... Lovely snap. Yeah. But yeah. W- would they hate that? Probably. Um, I'm I'm sure they would hate all sorts of things. Like, I'm sure that refrigerating chocolate is a, is like it, a yeah. it's probably a deep no no or it something. It probably I don't is. Know. You'd be sacked immediately if you <clears throat> knew anyone who'd ever done it. Probably. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> but they do, and actually, um, someone I know went on a chocolate, um, got a chocolate expert in for the day. And, Great. Uh, as a team building exercise, <laughs> I think they did a chocolate tasting. Oh, okay. Uh, not just to their house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the and the chocolate expertier expertier who came <laughs> around to like the chocolate expertier. It's going great. <laughs> got them all. You know all these quite serious business people who work in finance and they all had to they're all sitting there listening to their chocolate <laughs> oh really yeah like a tuning fork yeah wow yeah they do um jobs don't come up much sort of publicly for chocolate factories but occasionally uh Cas- cadbury will sort of say we're looking for new taste testers and they did that at one point where they put a sort of open audition out and there's so many four thousand applicants everyone went and they made the point of saying this isn't going to be easy this isn't just you sitting and eating chocolate saying wow how yummy like it's really <laughs> really intense. They had to go um, spend two and a half hours a day having their taste buds uh, put to different chocolate tasting tests. They had to sit in a soundproof booth. They had red lasers going around so that Why they could see the type of... Why are they in a soundproof booth? To hear the to chocolate. Hear the chocolate. <laughs> I guess Sorry, yeah, it was yeah. a sensory booth rather <laughs> rather than soundproof, but it's a similar thing. Um, Sorry, when you, you said uh, that they said, oh, it's not just about eating loads of chocolate all day, but the first thing you said was they had to sit and have their taste subjected to loads of chocolate for ages. <laughs> I mean, that's just eating loads of chocolate. No, no, but it? as in, yeah. But, intensely, But though. it's intensely. <laughs> yeah. I think they're slightly trying to SAS what is quite a nice job. And you yeah. obviously have to write down quite a lot of detail, I guess, about what you're tasting. Well, because like. they don't like work. They don't like if you say like, mmm, caramelly. They're like, no, no, no. We want the components. We want the makeup of this. We don't. But they want you to should know what's in it already. Like, <laughs> no, I shouldn't be required to retro engineer their chocolates for them. No, I, should no. be able, I should be saying if I like it or not. No, because yummy. you want to be able to say, oh, that hint of nutmeg is really speaking to me. You know, they want to. <laughs> you want to get the yeah, extra bit. What you mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah you don't yeah, want yeah. to just go. Wow, that's caramelly. <laughs> <laughs> that's my one. Was shaped like a tiny seahorse, and I love that. A <laughs> oh. I, I I once did, um, I once did uh, for Aussie Shampoo, I went in and tested their new scent. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I just remember smelling one and being like immediately, they were like, so what are the components can you smell? And all I could think of was like, it smells like a man one. It smells like a musky, <laughs> like a musk man one. And they were like, yes, because of why? And it was like, because it's like other men shampoo. <laughs> and, I, and then I didn't really say anything for the rest of the hour. Cause I was like, I actually can't smell. That's <laughs> I've discovered unless it's like yeah a man one so oh, like they pay, do they pay you in advance for that job they did do in advance for that job yes thank god otherwise it would have yeah um, well I think it is nice enough that employees at the Cadbury's factory and this was a stuff from about 10 years ago so it may not be a true now but they can still eat as much of the product as they like and they do tend to put on half a stone in the first 10 days of their employment 10 days wow. yeah and then I imagine you pair back I don't think you keep on gaining half a stone for every 10 days I would have thought they'd have a bucket. You know, you spit it, spit your chocolate into the bucket. Oh, like like tobacco, <laughs> like yeah. a cowboy. Probably yeah. a bit joyless. Yeah. Maybe they do, but then you can eat whatever you like from that bucket at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> like a fondue. Yeah. Yes. God. I assume they all just have no teeth, right? 
That's, yeah. yeah. You have the new guys coming in and they're like, well, we want to be careful <laughs> about the first 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> you do put on weight, but you save weight because your teeth weigh quite a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Sounds like a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so hey, Cadbury, that was the biggie. That was the thing that started chocolate off, basically, mm. in terms of this big global uh, Willy Wonka esque kind of world. Yeah. I th- uh, well, for me, that's Cadbury's yeah. always been the global brand. And um, so it started by a guy called John Cadbury. Uh, I was looking into him. Uh, he was born in Birmingham. He's the son of Richard Cadbury and his wife, Elizabeth Head. Very sad that they didn't take on the double barrel surname because you would have had Dickhead Cadbury. That would have been a lovely name. <laughs> and then, check this out, his second wife. Actually, his middle name was Tapper, so that's good anyway. Dick would you, Tapper. Would you like a nice fruit and nut Dick Tapper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. What was his, his wife called? Balland. <laughs> his, 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 so his second wife was called Candia. He married oh, a Candy. Wow. No. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, so he was an amazing guy, John Cadbury. He was um, he was very into animal rights. He set up the Animals Friends Society, which basically is what led into the RSPCA eventually coming about. It was sort of really? the forerunner and it sort of molded <laughs> into that. Um, and then he passed his company on to his sons. And they've set up this incredible place because they were Quakers. And so they've got this little place called Bourneville, mm. which was given its name oh. because it sounded French and therefore would sound really kind of oh, upper really? class. Yeah. So they just <laughs> yeah, gave Dickhead it. Dickhead Town didn't, um, <laughs> didn't fly for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, I'm the mayor of Dickhead Town. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and it's a it's like a model village. It's a model village, yeah. and it's still going to this day. It's quite, I find the terminology "model village" quite confusing because it means two quite different things. <laughs> You're right. He didn't set up a village of tiny houses that That's you can walk around. Wow, what a what a great for hobby all, for all the umpa lumpers. Yeah. <laughs> so he set up just what like a nice small village. What's, what's a model village? It was for the work. It was for Cadbury's workers, and it was basically. Um, it was a, a village of houses that were built along new architectural lines. They were designed to be, uh, you know, a development from the horrible slums that you'd got in a lot I of urban centres. Right. That every house had a garden and every house had a fruit tree and things like this. And, you know, okay. people were encouraged to live like, basically clean, healthy lives. These were all quite teetotal places as well. That's, that's the thing. That's all the downside. The, yeah. It's boring. Yeah. Unless it's changed recently and there's been quite a few people that have been trying to buckle it. It's a dry town, which yeah. is nuts. I just It's because the Quakers were uh, well, the Quakers were behind all three big chocolate companies, which were Cadbury's, Fries, and Roundtree. Yeah, so yeah. weird. And they weren't they because at the time Quakers weren't allowed in the professions. You can be a doctor or anything like that, oh. and they weren't allowed in public office. So they were in trouble. Oh, they can't basically. do those two. You've no. got to go into sweets and confectionery. <laughs> also, I suppose they're not drinking. They've not got a lot of good stuff going on. So, like, let's absolutely it cane it on the chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. their vice. You're actually missing a fourth. Quaker chocolate and I've got a product of theirs here this is by a different company now but I'm holding it in my hand it's a Wonka bar and the Wonka bar was created by Quaker Oats you know Quaker Oats? yeah they funded the movie they put three million dollars into the funding of the movie and they had a deal that they would have the chocolate merchandise that would come off the back of it and that's where we started getting Wonka bars but they had a huge oh. problem because the movie didn't take off to begin with. It was it was doing fine, but it didn't go massive. Mm. And really? the, this is the one with Johnny, uh, with, uh, not with, with Johnny Gene Depp, sorry, with Gene Wilder, mm. yeah. And the chocolate itself, they, they produce at the wrong temperature, as in the melting point of the chocolate was so inaccurate that when it was being transferred, it would melt in the oh, trucks right. and so on. <laughs> so they had a few problems and they sold it and sold it to different companies, but it was set up by Quaker Oats. So we've got a fourth Quaker company. Wow. Um, did you know that Cadbury's once reverse shoplifted a bunch of their cream eggs? Oh, oh so they sort of sneak them, them in into shops. shops. They snuck them in, yeah. Mm. I couldn't quite work out why they went to these lengths. This was in 2018. You might remember they uh, did a kind of Willy Wonka promo thing where they hid a thousand, about a thousand white chocolate eggs in cream egg wrapping oh, and yeah. I think if you opened a cream egg there'd be a golden ticket in there and it'd be a white chocolate egg and it's really exciting and then you could win £10,000 um, but the way they did it was they didn't <laughs> when they made the eggs they didn't tell anyone in the factory in Bourneville that they were making the eggs and they didn't tell any of the people in the shops where they were planting the eggs <laughs> they so just got <laughs> crack, this crack team of spies to break into the factory overnight under cover of darkness go in make these eggs smuggle them out and then kind of 
in disguise sneak into shops and slip them onto shelves. How many? Do we know how many they made? Uh, they said they made about a thousand. Yeah, yeah. you can do that job. in the course of a night. That's insane. I think it might have been multiple nights, but also I, I think a chocolate factory can churn out, yes, even a they thousand eggs. They make hundreds eggs. of thousands of cream eggs a year just I for know, a tiny you're, season. You're you breaking know. in, you've got to turn on the lights. You've got I'm to sure they created the a, yeah, a pretext of an away day. We're all going <laughs> yeah. on a chocolate listening course, <laughs> and uh, so no one needs to come to work tomorrow, you know. Um, and if you notice any white smears around the machinery, just, just, just disregard it. Get on with your work. Um, and then, so, who were the people who were sneaking them bit cool onto the job. shelves? That's such a cool job. I suppose you have to be very high up in Cadbury to get that gig. And it's also inconspicuous looking. Very inconspicuous. Like you want someone who looks just like a like a normal person, I guess. I would invent a sleeve that allowed me to drop off an egg. Uh, <gasps> yeah. Like lay an egg with your arm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly that. So I would be. I would pick up an egg. So no one would notice, and I would go and buy an egg, you know. Yeah. But no one's noticed the one I've secretly laid in the egg tray. Behind. <laughs> Can I tell you like a real life Willy Wonka? Mm. Yeah. This is a guy, have you heard of Forrest Mars? No. no. Was he responsible for Mars bars? He was. Wow. Forrest Mars. Forrest Mars. Uh, also Maltesers. Invented those. Mm. Okay. Uh, also Pedigree Chum and Uncle Ben's Rice. But those were... Like wow. his sort huge of, though, like solo albums of, of his uh -huh. his main career was in the confectionery world. Did he? He was he hands on invented all of those. I don't know. I don't he know how invented rice. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't. There was a technique with Uncle Ben's rice. It was just, I can't remember. But, in a pouch. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how on his hands were on Pedigree Chum, like, but he he's a big deal. He's yeah, a huge yeah, deal. Big yeah, guy, yeah. Big guy. And he did. I think he did with Maltesers. He took a, this tiny pellet of dough, this pea-sized pellet of dough, and then put it in a vacuum oven. You know, exploded it in a vacuum and then you cover that in chocolate, which is how they're made today. They're, they're made mm. in a vacuum. Anyway, very cool. But Forrest Mars was very eccentric, as mm. in uh, he was a bit of a tyrant. He would get his executives on their knees praying in meetings. He would lead them in prayers saying, I pray for Milky Way. I pray for Snickers. Um, for the success of it or like literally for a bar of <laughs> <laughs> for the success of it. so what, and he was a tyrant I think domestically as well his adult son John once asked to miss a sales meeting so Forrest Senior said he had to spend the entire meeting on his knees in prayer so I think and it's his, very into making people just get on their knees and pray a lot of it? praying it's a theme. Yeah. lot of praying going on um, he was so secretive about his life that when he died in 1999 Mars wouldn't even confirm that he died Gosh, I know. Oh, wow. So there is a bit of the, like, it's a quite a, an odd um, biography. Someone once saw him in an airport and shouted out, Forrest, Forrest Mars. And he marched over and he. He, he made said, them get on their knees and pray. That's right. It's more conspicuous, actually. Um, uh, he marched over and he said, Don't ever call my name out in public. He was Gosh. so concerned about being recognised or spotted or any of that. Yeah. I mean, really an unusual guy. Why have you called your biggest product after yourself? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Uncle Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's time for fact number three, and that is Anna. My fact this week is that the thumbs up emoji is contractually binding in Canada. <laughs> so be careful, Canadians. And this was as of this year. No, as of last year, 2023. We're now in 2024. But this is because of a legal case in Canada, in Saskatchewan. And there's they have the system there where a legal case will set legal precedent. You know, that will be the one that they refer back to. And there was a legal case where a guy called Kent Mickleborough a grain buyer um, who wanted to buy some grain so he texted a bunch of farmers and said anyone got any flax to sell me 86 tons of flax I want at 86 why 86 Kent is it called Kent Mickleborough Kent Mickleborough that's <laughs> pretty right. cool name frankly wasted on a flax buyer <laughs> oh, careful no buddy offense. this guy's litigious <laughs> 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 Flax buying is the coolest career. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, so and he needs the 86th ton for whatever reason. He wants okay. 86 tons, <laughs> exactly, at precisely 17 Canadian dollars a bushel. And one farmer responded, Chris Achter. That's A-C-H-T-E-R. Chris Achter responded. They chatted on the phone. And um, Kent was like, cool, I'll text you a contract. Kent texts him the contract saying, uh, please confirm this is the grain you want to buy, you want to sell at this price. And the farmer responded with a thumbs up emoji. Mm -mm. Fast forward a few months, grain doesn't arrive. Kent's like, where the hell's my grain, mate? You agree to this contract. Farmer says, no, no, I was just saying I've received the message. 
I wasn't agreeing to the contract. Confirming that he's thumbs upping that this is the contract. That I am that man. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, that's me. <laughs> but he's not signing. No. I understand that. Like, I get that position. Like, I've received this contract. Thank you. But I ne- yeah. they never signed it. Well, so these yeah. were the two positions that yeah. went to court. Yeah. I'm on, I think I'm on Chris Actor's side. Well, let's wow. let's argue it out as they did in the Canadian courts. Uh, you also had lost, I'm afraid, oh. and um, he had to pay eighty two thousand Canadian dollars in damages because it yeah. was determined that that thumbs up because the guy said in his text message, "You said please confirm this is okay," mm. and then with a picture of the contract. And I, I'm with you. A thumbs up can just be like I'm really late. I can't be able yeah. to respond now, but I'll do something to put them off. I think it's an incredibly. I don't want to weigh in with like an opinion here, but. <laughs> I think it is quite a passive aggressive thing to do a thumbs up emoji. I tried, I sent you one earlier yeah. this week, Dan, as an experiment to see how it felt. Oh, yeah. I didn't feel great after sending it. Oh. You know. Really? What? You felt like it's a bit of a thumbs down? I feel like it's a bit of a, yeah, 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 whatever, mate. Like, jog on. You know, it's sort of a. Well, it was a weird response to me telling you my dog died. <laughs> <laughs> jog on, mate. <laughs> I like, yeah. instead of a th- thumbs up, I've started um, doing a top hat. Um, oh, sort of nice. a, a jaunty, okay. just like a yeah, cool. I've got my glad rags on. <laughs> <laughs> I think is what I'm saying there. No, do you, I like that. I feel I would feel a bit special receiving a well, top yes, hat like, from Stevie. Like you know. to do. But also, as a, when my driving instructor, I have to I have to formally confirm contractually over text, and he'll say like uh, this time in this place confirm, and I just put a Y, and that means that is like if I. If, right, wait, if I miss why, it, like, why, why? why are you asking me to confirm? <laughs> and a top hat, and he doesn't seem to think that. No, <laughs> why for yes? Right. And okay. when I do that, I am in this ob- obligation to not cancel within seven days, and I did have to because I got COVID, and I was liable for like two hundred fifty quid, and like so it. But also, isn't isn't it because like if you. It's the word. This has turned into more it. of a personal complaint about your driving but instructors. Yeah. Cancellation no, but like, practice. Because like, I read about a while back, a, a long time ago, but it, maybe in 2019, about how like emojis are used in court for like um, someone sent their partner or uh, uh, ex-partner a gun emoji oh. and actually got sentenced mm. for threatening because people do use them in terms of words so if you're gonna you've got to I suppose yeah. come, on, come down yeah. on one side of it you can't just go well if it's a threat yes but if it's if it's a thumbs up because of flax no yeah. Like, yeah I suppose it's quite tricky you can yeah. see I'm just excited that you have first hand recent experience of this actual fact yeah, yeah. you've yeah. set legal precedent you and your driving instructor <laughs> Uh, Top hat means yes. <laughs> Twenty fifty quid, please. Oh god, yeah. It is an interesting point, though. Like, what if he had sent a heart, for example, mm. in response? Mm. You know, what yeah. what would be? Where's the boundary of I legally binding? <laughs> <laughs> and you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're right. I think because thumbs up has that meaning. Yeah. I can sort of understand why it went that way as well. You know, like a it's a sort of it's a, it's a yes. It sounds it? good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, and the, the actual, in fact, that was the thing that was brought up in court because the defence raised concerns that what if you send a fist bump? Is that a contract? Or is, mm. or is that I'm going to punch you and that's well, threat and then you get sent to prison? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or that lady tango dancer in the red dress. Yeah. I would take that as an absolute yes. Like, <laughs> we are, you're we're sending, on, we're going. You're sending twice as much flax as they've asked we're, for. <laughs> we're dating now. That's, uh... Dating the flax. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think the judge said, D- don't be silly. This is about a thumbs up and that's that's all it is, you know. Um, well, they, the, just to Andy's point about the thumbs up, actually, in China, you'd be right. Apparently the thumbs up emoji in China is bad oh amongst the youth because it is um but they asked uh, some chinese people what, like passive aggressive yeah i think um basically well, gen z's in china said that if someone sent them a thumbs up it means i don't like talking to you i want you to go away it reads like um ha- like okay and no punctuation that's what it reads like yeah, okay I, you're like ever, are you angry if i ever said okay and a full stop that's as angry as i can possibly <laughs> express yeah. myself like that's absolute yeah. I'm white hot with fury you yeah. know you know the Gargas uh, cave paintings in the Pyrenees? The, the Intimately. Ancient... Yeah, yeah. Those... <laughs> Who doesn't? No, can you explain? <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, yeah. But there are these cave paintings in the Pyrenees, in the Gargas caves, and yeah. they're very, very, very old. They're between twenty and 40,000 years old. They're quite hard to date, but like they're, they're, they're old. Mm. Um, and they're all stencils of hands, right? Okay, yes. Uh, and there are, there are, there are amazing images. They're online. beautiful. You look them up. They're yeah. sort of dozens of hands yes, overlaid on each other. I have and seen this, yeah. I think they made them by putting a, putting the hand on the cave wall and then spitting ochre paint. Really? Yeah, yeah oh. it says, yeah. Um, Gross. But the weird thing is, about half the hands appear to be injured. 
mm. or mutilated. You know, they're, they're short a finger or two, or some of them are short all four fingers. Mm. Um, and there's a theory that it's, it's a language about hunting, or it's a like it's an indication of something or another. But there is a theory that that could be the first thumbs up. It's either someone who's been tragically, ritually mutilated with the loss of all four of their fingers, <laughs> or it's the first ever thumbs up. Or it's an emoji. <laughs> or it's an emoji. <laughs> Yeah, that's fun. Oh. So there, there's a that's a it's it's hard to know. Yeah. Are Egyptian hieroglyphs like emojis? <laughs> they are because they're yeah, open to interpretation. They? Yeah, uh, and they're pictures. Great, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they actually had a writing system, but it just got so popular with the emoji side of things? <laughs> yes. Because yes. yeah, yeah. that's, that's where we're heading. Anyway. They were really frowned upon at first, the hieroglyphs, yeah. among the older generation. Hieroglyphs are passe. Dumbing it down. <laughs> <laughs> right, where does, emoji, where does the word emoji come from? What's it, what does it mean? Oh, Emotion and something exactly. Japanese. Bang, you fell right into my trap. Oh. It's nothing to do with emotion. Oh, wow. Oh, and this is so weird. So it's from the Japanese words for picture and character. So oh. air is picture, moji is character, right? That's weird. It has nothing to do with emotion. But weirdly, do you remember the emoticon? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like a colon and then a closed bracket is a smiley face. Yeah. yeah. That is an emotion icon. And that yeah. came first. That's but then so emoji weird. came second and is nothing to do with emotion. This wow. is like the sun so and the moon odd. being the same size coincidence. Mm. This is it's all that. falling into place. Yeah. I suppose yeah. it's like a lot of emojis that have got nothing to do with emotion, like a suitcase <laughs> or like the Easter Island head. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so that does now kind of check out, doesn't it? Yeah. I like, I like what they decide to add each year. So like there was a big mm. uproar because there was no avocado for ages. Right. And I think there wasn't a seal for a long time and that really got me down. And I think they've, they've <laughs> A seal it like when you seal an envelope. No, a little sea line. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Anna, we're getting Come more on. of a glimpse into your communication style. <laughs> and mine. Well, a wax I seal. It, there was no wax seal. I yeah. send it by seal. Like. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> um, um, do you know what the least popular emojis are? Because I, I really looked this up because when you know when you go to send one and you see this vast selection and you think, God, none of these must ever get a look in, mm -hmm. ever. Um, and there's actually a Twitter account called At Least Used Emoji, which kind of sadly for it doesn't seem to have tweeted since 2020. <laughs> but okay. in 2020, the same one had been top of its list for 264 days, which I guess is when it gave up and thought this is the ultimate loser. <laughs> Any guesses? What am I doing with my life? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even bots what get depressed. <laughs> Okay, um, is, it, is, it, is this gettable? Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's one that you won't have seen very often. Is it, so. an, is it an object? No, no. Is it a no. flag? You'll never get it, I've just realised. The least used one is the symbol that is an ampersand, an equal sign, um, a musical note, and a percentage sign. I, I what is they it? Come as one? They come as what a... What is it? What wow. does it mean? Well, I suppose no one's... Known, which well. is why because yeah. you don't really right. get package emojis like that's like four really unpopular ones that have got together in a super group to try yeah. and bump themselves up yeah and it's the opposite of a super group isn't it yeah. they thought they would be the traveling wilburys and they yeah um also the tramway symbol i really thought andy that you can't have been on line march in 2020 given that that was the joint least popular tram. Tram. yeah tramway symbol. an aerial tramway symbol <laughs> oh i don't i've popular. read something about that and it was a it's an it's a sort of hanging railway. It's a suspended railway. Yeah. And exactly. I saw someone claiming that there's only one suspended railway in widespread use in the world, and it's in China, which is why the emoji is not used. Actually, there is one in Germany, the um, Wuppertal Schwebebahn, which is a very popular <laughs> suspended nice. railway. Well, this is great. I can't is believe that, you and weren't. That's, and that's, it sounds, that sounds stupid now. That's where the train's like underneath the track. Yeah. It's right. so cool. I've accidentally cool. used that emoji before and been like, Why, what's that? But that is actually real. Wow. I didn't, didn't know. Go to Wuppertal. And, <laughs> I will. Uh, and I you'll have will. a whale of a time. It's, it's a really good. I think they put an elephant in it once. I've just had a memory that. That oh, feels. Wow. That unnecessary, doesn't it? Can't. <laughs> can they? Oh, to prove that it clings to the top, like you can even put an elephant in it. I think. <laughs> I'm now re fall off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm now really <laughs> doubting. I'm really doubting myself. I've got to find out. I've got to find out. I'm not sure what you do. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you go quiet for a bit and then go. Oh, did you is find? It, is it? Did you put an elephant in it? They d supposedly they put an elephant. They did put an elephant in it. Right. They put an elephant in the Wuppertal Schreiber Barn in 1950 as a stunt. Either to promote the monorail or the circus. <laughs> Both, I <laughs> and guess. It, and Why it not? fell in. <gasps> huh. Panic had broken out in the carriage, which apparently also had passengers in it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. god. Oh, this is bizarre. This is insane. I'm just on the Wikipedia for it now. The elephant, it was called Tuffy, was fine. 
and uh, and survived another 39 years. I thought you wow. meant he was fined. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like, it's not his fault! <laughs> Hadn't paid for a ticket, mate. Right, he's what fine. I'm this? glad he was okay. He became famous in 1950. Oh, she, she actually accidentally, obviously, fell from the Wuppertal Schwebebahn into the River Wupper. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. But she survived. she survived. Yep. For 39 years. Yeah. I've got to keep that in mind. How did she fall? Did they not shut the doors? Well, what it says, what it says here is that... <laughs> She was put on the monorail as a publicity stunt. Yeah. Tick. Elephant trumpeted wildly and ran through the carriage, Aww. broke through a window, and fell 12 metres down into the river, <laughs> suffering only minor injuries. A panic had broken out in the carriage, naturally, and some passengers were injured. That's right. a big ass window. Yeah. It's a big elephant, window. Sorry. Yeah. Or a small elephant. Small, small elephant. elephant. Asian elephant, elephant, not African Depends elephant. Depends how you're looking at it. Are you through your legs or are you. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! Bonjour! Guten Tag! Konnichiwa! Hey everyone! This week's episode of Fish is sponsored by Babbel. Wow, that was like having, insert name of famous linguist, in the room <laughs> with me. <laughs> that was amazing, Dan. I like to learn how to say hello in 14 languages and nothing else. <laughs> Babbel is truly exceptional. If you're someone who likes to learn languages or you're going overseas and you just need to make sure that you actually have local lingo in order to help you get along, Babbel is the number one place in the world to do that. A language learning app that shows you how to speak in real life language, not this sort of old language of asking how do I find a toilet or a baguette in the toilet, whatever it is you're looking for. This is real life up-to-date dialogue. Absolutely. It's a tried and tested method that they have at Babbel. You can learn a new language with just 10 minutes of it a day. There's so many different ways of learning. You have lessons, you have podcasts, you have games, so much more. And right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months for free with the purchase of a six-month subscription. And the way you do that is by using the promo code no such thing. That is all one word, no such thing. That's right. So head to Babbel, that's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash play. Use that promo code, no such thing as one word. You're going to get six months free with a purchase of a six month subscription. Do get it now. Sayonara. Uh, au revoir. And uh, I haven't got to the goodbyes yet. On with the podcast. <laughs> Babbel, your guaranteed path towards speaking a new language. On with the podcast. Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is Andy. My fact is that there is a fish that spends its entire life upside down. Is it trying to make the moon look smaller? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, um, this is a fact. It was sent in, actually, by Kate Blazinski. So thank you, Kate. Mm. Uh, it's about a kind of anglerfish. Sorry, that does sound like a pseudonym for Anna. Kate yeah. Mazinski. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. Uh, this was sent by Anna. Um, so anglerfish are the ones which, uh, they have a tentacle, and they have like a fishing rod sticking out of their head, mm. and then they use the end of the rod that's got a little glowing ball of light on it, and they use that to attract prey to them. Um, it's, it's pretty incredible. We say it casually. <laughs> It's amazing. But you've it got a light bulb hanging off your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. And it's absolutely rod. amazing. Well, and it's bacteria that is lighting it up as well. It's not like an actual light bulb. It is an actual... It's, you've got to feed the rod <laughs> for them to... so weird. Yeah. Like, it's genuinely it's amazing. And sometimes they accidentally uh, like chew their own... No. Um, uh, ...tentacle Do sort they? of fish <laughs> rod thing. Because they, oh. they close their mouth and they go, oh, you know, and then they... <laughs> Obviously, sometimes they trap themselves. It. Ow! Um, anyway. Like biting your tongue, basically. It's basically yeah. biting your tongue. <laughs> <Light>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the whipnose anglerfish. And mm. for years, it was just assumed that it went the right way up. It just went around the right way up. Yeah. People assumed that. <laughs> because we've only seen dead ones, presumably, with anglerfish, right? You don't yeah, often see them because they the live wild. very, very deep uh, right. in the deep ocean. And yeah. it was assumed to be, hunt, to be upright, an upright fish, like yeah. all fish. But they got some camera footage in 1999 of one of these swimming around the ocean upside down with the t fishing rod dangling down beneath it. Very weird. They thought, well, what a weird, what a weird one-off fish. <laughs> and so 
And they, but they keep finding these like deep sea drones keep filming these uh, anglerfish w- swimming around upside down, and it appears they spend their whole life swimming upside down to attract prey. Oh. But Who apparently, knows? it is better for it so that it doesn't bite itself. That's oh. that's in part of the description oh. of the right. nose. Yeah, it's just helpful. It just gives it a tiny bit more of it of an advantage. It's quite cute. They're yeah. very cool. Anyway, they're they so are weird. Yeah. Anglerfish. anglerfish are insane. They do this thing, and I know I, I always like get too surprised by this, but evolution. <laughs> Whoa. What a what a great idea! Like, it, so one of the things is, is that it's got like it's bioluminescent in that rod, but also it will eat a lot of fish that are bioluminescent. And an anglerfish um, has a really elastic kind of tummy, very rubbery, so it can eat things that are almost twice its size, right? And so it goes quite transparent. Except it doesn't because there's black lining on the inside, so you can't see the bioluminescence inside it. Brilliant. So it can't attract predators, you know, if there's something inside swimming around that's still not dead. Kind of like a car that has tinted windows. You yeah. don't know what's inside the car, but you can, you, like... It well, does it on purpose so that yeah. it's not gone transparent. Got, like, I went to the extra, gym once yeah. and my leggings had gone see-through and everyone could see my knickers and butt. Right. That's the opposite. Yes. yes. So if like, you'd had this, if ability. I was an anglerfish, I could have just made my leggings more opaque. For if example, only. one yeah. of the many reasons to want to be one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that really puts it in context. That it does. Story. Thank you. It yeah. wants to really bring it down to earth or up to earth. <laughs> they are this this one that you mentioned, Andy. The whip nose is a classic anglerfish in that it's just the females you're talking about. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. It's pretty much whenever anyone talks about cool stuff with anglerfish, it's just the ladies because they are way bigger than the males. So in the whipnose ones, then the females are like half a meter and the males are two centimeters. <laughs> And I think <laughs> there's another kind of anglerfish which has the Guinness record for the biggest dimorphism between males and females. And this I find so hard to believe, but uh, Guinness says that the females are more than 60 times the length of the males and half a million times as heavy. That's crazy. Mate. Which mating means must be wild. The mating is. I odd. think the yes. mating is basically the, the the male sort of latches onto the female, yeah. just yeah. kind of bites the side of her and then fuses and then dissolves into her and all that's left is a tiny pair of testicles hanging I off the side. I can't. That's incredible. <laughs> that's basically it. Their, well, yeah. their skin and their organs all fused together. And for oh. a, a long time, I think they assumed that there wasn't a male in the picture at all, right? They just thought it was a female. And actually, you're looking. Like, that's look, him. That's, that's him. Testicles. Yeah. <laughs> I know those testicles anyway. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. We all know couples like that. Oh, yeah. Hey. Like, um, et cetera. I wonder if there's what the perfect distance is, kind of like with the clips of a moon and the sun that you could have the male anglerfish near you and the female <laughs> that they will appear the to be the same size yeah yeah do you get females don't you which have lots of pairs of testicles just hanging off them yeah you get, uh, you get six, six or seven males will have been fused into one female at once really yeah yeah you have multiple just like, you know oh, have you had many previous boyfriends no actually don't. <laughs> yeah. you don't oh need to tell God. me or it's like, like a brownie sash with your badges that you've collected yeah exactly <laughs> 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 That's how you explain this to your five-year-old. Oh, yeah. like brownies. <laughs> oh, no, they're brilliant. They're so good. They are. Um, yeah. And they do, when they're lava, they look really cool. And there's not enough focus on this in the anglerfish world Ooh. of chat. Um, <laughs> they, when they're lava, they're surrounded by this jelly egg. So that is transparent. And so you'll see this tiny little anglerfish. And then it's got this big see-through pile of jelly around it. Like they're like, absorbing. Like absorbing, exactly. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's very absorbing. cool. Absorbing. You guys have seen an anglerfish? No. In no. person? Not in, not in the flesh. No. I've met one. Get what? away. Yeah, yeah. I met one. I met a very famous one. Um, I met the one that basically was in Blue Planet that was um, discovered by... <laughs> all of your, I can't all believe I name dropped an anglerfish. All anecdotes are so <laughs> name exhausting. Name dropping. Are you a close personal friend of I this was, anglerfish? I was at a cocktail party with her. We got chatting. We're working she on She doesn't even podcast. remember you, Dan, okay? <laughs> <laughs> How many testicles did she have on <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so uh, years ago, I got to work with um, Alistair Fothergill. He came on Museum of Curiosity, and um, he's the person who found the hairy anglerfish. So he went down, he filmed it. They... <laughs> <laughs> so it's a euphemism <laughs> and a half, isn't it? <laughs> um, and they... Did he show you his hairy anglerfish? <laughs> Slimy. <laughs> yeah. um, so they brought it back up and it dies in the process. So oh. When they died, did their lights go out? Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, like a Pixar. They might do, wow. but they would live on, wouldn't they? They would, that's even sadder. Because this oh. is the nuts thing, is that they're bacteria. Yeah. And I was reading and think, how do they get these bacteria? Yeah, yeah. Because 
normally when hosts have symbionts, you know, things living on them that rely on them, they either find them in the local area or, or they um, or they inherit them from the sexy symbionts <laughs> yeah. in your area. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Bacteria want to live on your nose. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, so, but and then but they sometimes inherit them from their parents with other animals. But anglerfish never have any contact with their parents. It would be insane Aww. for them to. It has been dissolved. <laughs> <laughs> Come say hi to your father. Yes. Yes. He's like, Give him a little jiggle. <laughs> <laughs> It's <laughs> a real male role model problem, isn't it? <laughs> uh, um, but no, they, they don't get their lure until much later in life even. So they must find them in their area. They must pick them up from around oh. the place and they have them on the end of their nose. What, and if, sort of... what if they like d- didn't find enough? That would be like a Pixar film, like the angler fish that couldn't good. find the bacteria. That's a good one. That's yeah. good. Don't, yeah. m- maybe edit that out so I can write it. Yeah. No, I'm joking. Please don't. I will never write that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I found something that swims, but it can never be upside down. Ooh. Mm. Riddle me this. <laughs> what okay. could that be? So something big My and flat. My vision. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like a manta ray? Maybe the, they're big and flat, but they can't. Mm. They swim, but they. No, okay. No. Okay. All right. A starfish. Um, not a starfish. Oh, stupid. A ball. You've got to think more laterally. A ball, a ball has no upside a boat. down. Uh, do Both they things. swim? <laughs> oh, okay, a water boatman. I was actually just. Uh... Shall I just give you the answer? Yes, yeah. probably. Yeah. The answer is the word swims. Snooze. Swims is an ambigram. You flip oh, it upside yeah. down, and it's exactly the same. I've got very hot. Wow. <laughs> With arousal. <laughs> yes, I'm incredibly aroused. That's amazing. I love that yeah. stuff. That yeah, that's is a really good. That, that works perfectly. Great. From there, so that's great. Mm. That's, that's very really nice. lovely that's stuff, Dan. Mm. Who and would have thought? The Ten riddle. In. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. <laughs> you can stay. You've right. passed the audition. I said a boat. That's why I'm I host this podcast. They, they don't swim and they can be upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Famously. <laughs> Just another thing on how fish swim. Yeah. Mm. Do you know how to tell if a fish is depressed? Oh, Ooh. no, don't. Um, too sad. Okay. Because well, we've got a cure. Great. There you go. What a roller coaster. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't even said the fact yet, please. That's the cure. Come on the podcast. So we'll raise your spirits right up. What's the cure? Um, well, antidepressants. And we only have a cure because we've trialed human antidepressants on them to make them better. <laughs> but and what's the how, do you, how do you know that they're depressed? So they swim at the bottom of their tanks. So mm. depressed fish swim low and happy fish swim at the top of the surface of the water oh. or at the top of their tanks. And this is actually really useful, according to scientists who do trial antidepressants, because it's a really obvious sign that they're depressed. <laughs> so we can trial antidepressants on them and we know if they're working. And they, they just go higher because they just get higher wow. and higher. So you go, oh, Prozac, wow. that's doing the trick. Look, it's like in it's the out air, out the water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it true, or have I just like made this up in my brain that like uh, goldfish like um, grow to fill their tanks? If you actually give them a bigger tank, they just <clears> keep that going. Is that is true, and that's yeah. so sad that's so in massive. retrospect because you know, like when you when I was growing up, we had just like a little tank with three right. fish, and you're like. God, we were sort of shrinking Stunting off the their potential. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that's the just... thing when people throw them into the wild, into to little lakes and so on, they just turn into these turbo shark. <laughs> yeah, <like>. exactly. <laughs> you were doing a public service by true, keeping yeah, them from, you. you know, um, taking over. Um, yeah. up, so upside cute. downness. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is a very weird thing. The, which is better for a rhino to be upside down or uh, not upside down, lying down? Is it in the circus? It's not in the circus. It's not. Okay. Uh, let me take you to the Wuppertal Schwebe but No, okay. <laughs> it's better for a rhino to be upside down than it is for it to be lying on its side. Isn't that weird? How does okay. it get that? Why? Well, we, I think we might have mentioned a while ago. We've they, done this about the rhinos. They being, transport yeah. rhinos to new areas by putting okay. them in a he- helicopter, stringing no, them no. up by their ankles. <laughs> no, no, not in the helicopter. Sorry. <laughs> 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 no. They. They hog tie them. Right. They l- lift them up upside down, and then they fly to the new nature reserve where they have to get them to. It's the easiest way to transport them. Okay. Uh, it takes like ten or fifteen minutes. It's really fast. Um, and well, no, it depends well, on regardless the distance. of where they're going. <laughs> yeah. and, on, and on traffic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're normally not taking them like from South Africa to Tunisia. You know, it's yeah, normally yeah, yeah. a short journey. Um, 
but nobody had checked how their hearts and lungs actually cope with this journey and, and oh. a team of scientists led by Robin Radcliffe from Cornell uh, realised oh we should probably look into whether or not they're yeah they're like oh my god upset and, like, they're, yeah, yeah. and um, so they, they held 12 rhinos upside down by their feet for an experiment <laughs> uh, from a crane um, and they're all sedated obviously but right. they were just testing their heart and lungs and it turns out that it's much better for it to be upside down because when a rhino's on its side their lungs are a bit distorted you know the gravity means oh, they're yeah, not, yeah. the lungs are not getting equal amounts mm-hmm. of oxygen for the air exchange and all of that gas exchange but when they're upside down it is equal because they're just upside down lovely so and when they sleep do they go upside down naturally? they go upside down yeah yeah like on their backs like uh, rhinos they, they, yeah yeah they if, you, if you go for a walk in certain bits of Namibia you'll look up in the trees and you can see Stop. hanging from the trees Stop it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I just wanted to be wrong the back. That's all I meant. No, I don't think. I don't think they, they like should. They should. They should. They should. There are there were like rhino articles on the web. You've been sleeping all wrong your whole yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> there is another fish that swims upside down. Um, and Antar- well, it's not actually a fish. It's krill. Not technically a fish, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but forestalling an- the letters. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Antarctic krill. Um, swim upside down in the Antarctic when the water's covered in ice so that they can graze like cows on the underside of the ice. Gorgeous. And they eat algae that grows on the underside of the ice. Oh. And they live such a weird life. They migrate, have quite a weird migration, but up and down. So they graze on algae swimming upside down and then they get quite fat and heavy from it. And then they sink because they're too heavy. <sighs> And they have to fan themselves out like a parachute and they sink about 50 metres down and then they think, oh God, I'm really hungry again. So then they've used up all their food supply. So then they have to swim up to the top again, eat and then sink. And that's their lives. And they do it about three times a day for their whole lives. Wow. And then they die. (laughs) But I I go to the fridge more than three times a day. You know, I'm just saying I empathise. That's that's my life too. Is that your whole life? <laughs> Upside down. Going back and forth for, from a food, for a food source. Yeah. It kind of, it kind of is, is when you think about you're it. You're so right. Like, it's what I'm we at, all do, isn't I'm it? I'm at work. I then go downstairs. I get some food. <laughs> but Andy's always got a plate of something that he just comes up with. Something yeah. on the go. Oh, I thought you, Dan, were saying that is kind of our life our, in a philosophical way. I thought, I thought way. you were saying yeah, I, 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 I thought that. No, yeah, that was true. The only reason they don't have a podcast is it's too wet for all the equipment. Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter, our Instagram, our threads, our any <laughs> Facebook. Uh, there's so many options that you can find us on. I'm on at Schreiberland. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. Various. <laughs> Stevie. Mastodon only. <laughs> no, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Stevie M. The S is a five. I regret it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you want to get to us as a group, Anna, where do they go? You can tweet at no such thing or email podcast at qi.com. Yep. Or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing. All of our previous episodes are up there, so do check them out. Also, lots of bits of merch. And also, there's the Club Fish entrance point. Join us, get access to all those fun things like drop us a line, all the extra bonus shows that we do. That's all there. Anyway, otherwise, just come back next week. We'll be back with another episode, and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Thank you